rest of the room? <laughs> All right. Just because I love, I'm so, property rights I hold so dear to me, um, if Miss Elting will name a price with no conditions, I will buy or sell at any price. I will choose. So I'm making that public offer right here, right now. Miss Elting names her price. I choose whether to buy or sell. If you're impressed and you missed out, I want you to understand it one more time. I will offer to choose. She can split the cake and I will choose it and we can all get on. And, it, and we've already taken this coming to incredible heights. We continue to overcome adversity and take it to better heights. But we can end this litigation right away. And I'm hoping that Ms. Elting will take me up on this offer. I think you guys all know, and I really, I, I super appreciate from the bottom of my heart you being here. You guys know I love Transperfect. I consider you my family. I'm super happy. It gives me great pleasure to produce the youngest tenured law professor ever in the history of Harvard at 28 years old, the, the greatest constitutional scholar of our time, and our keynote speaker, Mr. Alan Dershowitz. Wow, what a great evening. The moot court was so encouraging. You know, we live in a time when many people are discouraged about the future of our country. I wish everybody could have seen this moot court. The young people who participated are the future of our country, and they are fantastic. And I read the first 10 briefs. Every one of them would have been a brief I would have been proud to sign. Every one of them was a superb first-rate piece of work. I want to join with my judicial friends to say, better than most briefs I've seen in the United States Supreme Court and in other courts. And if you promise you won't tell anybody, better than most of the moot court briefs at Harvard that I judged over the years. With a few exceptions of my former students who are here, who are here today. I have to tell you that these briefs were so good that I think this contest is going to change the nature of legal research in America. Why would any client hire an expensive law firm that charges $1,500 an hour to write a brief when they can have a contest and get better briefs from students? So, Phil, you got this stuff on the cheap. And that's why you were prepared, it wasn't announced previously, to actually raise the amount that was given to the second place tie winners. Each of them is getting a full $25,000. And the grand prize of $65,000 is going to a remarkable young man, Stephen Hermosa. Stephen. I think Stephen won this in large part because of the judges. What do I mean by that? They asked him the hardest questions, and he was prepared to answer the hardest questions in a most persuasive way. When I teach appellate advocacy, I always teach my students, welcome hard questions. A hard question is an invitation to move your case forward. First of all, it tells you what the judges are thinking, and it gives you an insight into what you have to argue. When lawyers go to court with a prepared argument, which they refuse to deviate from, they're not doing anything other than resubmitting their brief. Lawyers have to learn how to be responsive to the cues given by the judges, and Stephen uh, was superb in presenting his argument through the very tough questions that the judges asked. So all of the finalists did absolutely great. They all answered questions magnificently, but in life you have to make choices. And this was the choice that we made as a collection of judges. Now it's very important for law students, some of you may believe that the judges were too tough. You know, uh, when I started teaching in law school 53 years ago, we were very tough on the students. And we were demanding, maybe too tough if you saw Paper Chase. But it's turned too far in the opposite direction. Today, too many teachers say, 
to every student, oh, your argument was superb, but we're not going to criticize you. It's very important for students to be confronted with tough questions by tough judges, because that's real life. That's what you're going to get. You've got four judges today. We've all argued, a number of us here in front of the nine justices of the Supreme Court, particularly when the late Justice Scalia was on the bench. He was unforgiving in his questioning. He would throw the hardest questions at you. I'll never forget. When I just had met my wife, we were engaged, and I had to argue a double capital case in the United States Supreme Court. Scalia had just recently been appointed, and he was throwing these law school hypotheticals at me, and he was trying to really show he was the smartest judge, the smartest person on the bench. Finally, Thurgood Marshall banged on the table and said, Justice Scalia, we're talking about the lives of two young people here. Get serious, let's get to the issues of the case. But judges do ask very, very hard questions. And the difference between superb lawyers, who all of whom, what we heard tonight was superb, and truly exceptional lawyers, lies in the ability to respond to questions, to deviate from the prepared argument, to deviate from the brief, and to turn a question into an opportunity to move your argument <clears throat> forward. Having said that, I want to mention that there's no such thing as who's the smartest lawyer, who's the most intelligent. <clears throat> my friend Howard Gardner wrote a book a few years ago that I recommend to all my law students and I recommend to all of you. It's called Multiple Intelligences. And he argues that there are seven really, and there are probably more, different kinds of intelligences. And everybody who submitted a brief excels at at least one of those different kinds of intelligences. But some of you may excel more at one kind than another kind. And you should figure out what level of intelligence of the multiple intelligences will suit your career best and focus on becoming part of a career path that exemplifies and takes competitive advantage of your particular type of intelligence. So I'm, when I'm asked, is this lawyer smarter than that lawyer? That's not a good question. It's which lawyer is more capable of doing a good job in a particular uh, case. And I just urge if there are any lawyers out there, if I were running a law firm, I would grab up every one of these lawyers who participated today and offer them jobs immediately in my appellate <laughs> section. <laughs> Having spoken to the students, let, let me speak a little bit about the issues. You know, the issues involved in this case are central to the liberty and freedom of all Americans. The idea of property However you define it, and the limitation on the government's ability to take something you worked for all of your life is something that is so important and is not a liberal conservative divide. The people who are working on this case represent every part of the political spectrum from liberal to conservative. This is an issue on which Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton fundamentally agree. Jefferson wrote about the right to privacy, the right to property, as an essential right of limitation of government. And of course, we know Hamilton felt the same way. The implications of allowing a taking here, particularly without consideration of other alternatives that would have allowed the property owners to keep their property, raises the most profound and fundamental issues of how governance operates in a free market society. This is a corporation that is the American dream. Two young kids in a dorm room figuring out how Woo! to turn Woo! translation into a major international corporation. This is a model that should be applauded and taught in business schools all over the world. This is the way innovation operates. This is the way startups operate. This is what we want to encourage. And we don't want to take the labor of people's efforts away from them unless there is extraordinary cause or basis for doing so. TransPerfect is, again, 
the American dream. A model corporation in terms of competitiveness, profitability, employer relations, and the public interest. And the idea that somehow some hedge fund or some anonymous third or fourth party will put in some sealed bid, will take the company, sell off its assets, it, you know, unemploy its workers, and show a profit to its hedge fund uh, investors is obscene. It's literally obscene. <laughs> and why is it happening? It's happening because of an oxymoron. An oxymoron called Delaware Justice. It doesn't exist. Delaware has a narrative about how it thinks corporations should operate, and if you deviate from that narrative, or if you offend the sensibilities of the great Judge Strine, you're going to see injustice prevail. I have to tell you, I have argued over 250 appeals in 53 years of practice, and I've argued them not only in this country, but in other countries. I have never experienced a judicial tyrant like Judge Strine. But fortunately, the rule of law transcends individual justices and individual judges. And ultimately, we will see the rule of law prevail here. I'm so proud to be associated with this wonderful corporation. I'm so proud to be associated with the Shaws, mother and son. I too joined Phil in the hope that perhaps we can get a resolution of this issue. His offer is, when you think about his offer, it is the paradigm of justice. It is the opposite of King, you know, it is it's not King Solomon's offer to split the baby in half. It's the response of keeping the baby whole. His offer, just remember what he said to his co-shareholder, come up with a number. If the number you think is too low, then, you know, you can buy it at that number if it's too high. It, he's, he's made an offer that in the words of, to, the, the, to turn it around, of the Godfather, it's an offer that can't be refused. How can you refuse that offer? Come up with a number and he'll either buy at that number or sell at that number. You have the control, you have the option. How can you take stock away from owners when the option is there? He's also offered, and his mother have offered, to vote her way. These are offers that are so reasonable and that expose the unreasonableness of what the courts in Delaware have done. And so the struggle for justice is slow. Justice grinds finely and it moves slowly. But ultimately, as Martin Luther King told us so many years ago, the arc of justice in the end bends toward real justice. And so I'm confident that with the intensity that the, the Shaws have, with the brilliant legal team that they've assembled, many of whom are here tonight, and I have to tell you, I'm just you know a distant consultant on the team. The incredible hard work was done by the lawyers on the ground, on this table, too many here to mention by name. The quality of their legal work has been superb. It will get better as the result of the briefs and the oral arguments we heard today. And together, with the input of the students, the input of the lawyers, the energy of the shores, I am confident we will prevail and justice will prevail. Thank you all very much. Now, can we present the award to Stephen Hermosa? Please come up. Stephen.
were fantastic. You were really great. It was such a pleasure to listen to you. It was a pleasure to read you. You are going to be, you along with the others here, are going to be the leaders of the bar. You're going to be great lawyers. You're going to go from here to higher places. I hope you will be able to use the resources that we've provided you to be able to use these in the interests of justice. And uh, could you tell us a little about, about yourself? Uh, what year are you in? I recently graduated. Graduated. What law school? Uh, University of Florida. Go Gators, right? Right? I actually have a hat that they gave me. Hold on, I need to say, I went to University of Florida and this contest was blinded. Nobody, nobody knew where anybody was from. But now we know. And, and, and you didn't, you got no home court advantage for me, even though I live in Florida during the winter. But remember, I went to Yale Law School. That was one of the other competitors. And I lived in Boston for 50 years. That was another one of the competitors. So every one of the competitors has a, a, a contact with. But the combination of your brilliant brief, your brilliant oral argument, your ability to answer sometimes very, very difficult questions that were thrown at you. What most impressed me about you is you not only answered the questions, but you use the questions to further your argument. You took the answer and then you took it a step forward. By the end of your answers, you were not in the same position you were in before the question was asked. You were in a better position. And that to me is the key to extraordinarily effective oral argument. So, someday, I expect to see you on the other side of the table from me, and I expect you'll whip my rear end. So you're going to be a great lawyer. Congratulations. Yeah. All right, enjoy your meals.